My name is Gabe Ignetti, and I'm the progressive eco-modernist. And if anyone is wondering about what eco-modernism is, we eco-modernists are defenders of and advocates for the maximum advance of science in the service of humanity. And if anyone is interested in learning more about that, just go to ecomodernism.org and you could read an eco-modernist manifesto there and learn more about us. So on our show today, we have Victor Tiffany. Victor is a lifelong activist who holds a master's in social science who wrote a book called Burn Your Bust. So Victor, how you doing? Well, I'm healthy. So even before we talk about the book, talk a little about what you think about Bernie having left the race. It's clear that Biden 2020 cannot defeat anybody for any level of office. He's lost a step. He's suffering from clear, obvious cognitive decline. But now that Bernie's dropped out of the campaign, we're setting aside electoral politics. Our new project we're going to start working on in solidarity with people like Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske, they're calling for a general strike. This country is on its knees, and the time is ripe for a general strike to basically threaten to take this country all the way on down unless Congress passes Medicare for all. And if Trump has indicated he's willing to sign it, that this is a great time. So maybe two demands, Medicare for all, and whether that's two months or six months, UBI, universal basic income, $2,000 a month, so that those of us at the bottom can survive this pandemic, this loss of income and so forth. And we will be making it as clear as possible to as many voters as we possibly can using our networks. We have a list of 53,000 people who took the Bernie or Bus pledge, plus- We've got, there's three thousands a lot. Yeah, but yeah. it's almost as many as Democratic Socialists have in America. And I have almost four and a half thousand people following me on Facebook, just me as a person. Wall Street Journal did a lengthy interview with me a while back, right here in this office. It was pretty interesting. And she had somebody look at my connections. And apparently I'm able to reach over a million people just from my Facebook page, just from my personal Facebook page. We want to figure out how to organize a national general strike. Well, the unions have to do that. That's something the unions have to take up. Yeah, no, that's, that we don't trust the unions. The unions have corrupt leadership. We basically want to do this without union input. I mean, if they want to join us, that's great. But we're not going to sit here and wait for union leadership to get on board. We're not going to sit here and wait for Bernie Sanders to join us. We are organizing a general strike quickly as possible. Rent strike, mortgage strike, student loan payment strike credit card payment strike, and the big one is food strike. Truck drivers, delivering food, clerks, cashiers, people stocking shelves in grocery stores, chefs, cooks, everyone. Just stop working, go home. There's two ways they could do it. They could lie and say, I've been exposed to somebody with COVID-19. They wanna sort of protect their job, or they could just call in and say, I'll come back to work as soon as President Trump signs Medicare for all bill. So we want everyone to go on strike except for healthcare workers, transportation workers, and energy. Other than that, everyone goes on strike everywhere, everywhere across the country. That's essential workers too. The only people working right now are essential workers. Oh, we know that. We know they're essential. That's why would that's what would force Congress to act so quickly. They would have to act within a week or two, and, or else this country would go into chaos. Yeah, well, I think that's already going on with the coronavirus. Everybody's out but essential workers. To a large extent, you're right. You know, I mean, we can't get out there now because of this virus, but it's really, you know, building a strong union movement. Well, that's what makes a general strike so well-timed. You don't have to go out. You don't have to organize in the streets. You just stay home. It's beautiful. Yeah, well, it's the essential workers. I mean, like I said, I think, I think that's already happening. But I'll say this. Once this is all over, that if you had a general strike, I'd listen, I'm always for that. You know? Well, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Because yeah. half of us are already at home. Yeah. No, I know that. I mean, like, all the people that are working is working to keep us alive. And 
to tell them don't deliver food. It's the food. You shut off the food, which is essential. Right? Ooh, this, yeah. this, this kind of food general strike isn't going to last long because the American people, they will call Congress and they will say, pass Medicare for all. Now, let these food people go back to work. We need food. Give Congress no choice. I'll tell you something. Here's what we need to do, and it's not exclusive to what you said. I think you'll agree with me on this. I'll give you an example. Chipotle's, they had a strike action because they're not allowing sick leave. They're forcing workers to work while they're sick in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, this is happening. I know I have a relative who works in one of these supermarket chains, and they won't allow him to wear gloves or mask or anything because they don't want to frighten the people. That's the kind of thing that you walk out over because these companies are endangering the workers and they're endangering the public. And let the people know, chipotles, screw chipotles, let them they'll shove their food right up to where the sun don't shine because the way they treat their workers. What we want to do is broaden that into a revolt. We need a broad general strike, including those food workers. If you don't include the food workers, Congress isn't going to act. They'll just wait. They'll just wait us out. Yeah. The Bernie and Bus side, it's a binary system that we, we're under. No, you're living in a two-party mental prison. We have walked out of that prison. And Bernie or Bus is the vehicle to escort people out of that two-party mental prison. It's not a mental prison. It's a prison, period. <laughs> so Bernie or Bus is a, the keys to the door to get out of that prison. But we can talk about Bernie or Bus because that's a different subject. I don't think you can be worse than a demented warmonger. Let's be clear. Biden is to Trump's right when it comes to war and peace. Not that Trump is a pacifist by any stretch, but Biden is a hawk. And Trump is reluctant to use military force in some ways. Not, not, not enough, but in some ways he's reluctant. Biden is a hawk. He calls it a muscular foreign policy. If he wins the election, you'll have a hawk who's suffering from cognitive decline. I think Trump is far more of a warmonger than he's made out to be, and, and Biden far less. The, the Saudi-led war in, in Yemen, he wants to end support for that. When they had the surge in Afghanistan, he said to Obama and the military command, he was against it. What he said was, just leave it as is, and as long as we have air superiority, we just keep the, the regime there in power, and that's the best you could do. Don't do no search. Yeah, let's remember Trump ran on pulling out of Afghanistan. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I got to tell you something that would shock you. I, I'm not so crazy about pulling out of Afghanistan or even the deal that Trump did because I think that we have hardly any casualties. We had a base there. And the Taliban are fascists. I read what would happen if they took over. You know, to me, I think it's good that we just have our base there. You have to decide, well, are we going to be a republic or are we going to be an empire? And if you want to stay in places like Afghanistan, you're making that decision. We're yeah. going to behave like an empire. There is times when major powers need to project force, I think. Like ISIS, I think that was necessary. Yeah, um, no, I disagree with that. I think that was a regional problem. We did not need to be the world's police. The Saudis, they have an air force. The Saudis? Forget it. Them and ISIS are almost the same kind. They're horrible. You know what it's like to me? It's like if you have power and you see a woman being raped, and do you just say, well, I'm not going to interfere? I think ISIS assault on these busy people, and I think what Obama did there was right. He basically got them isolated and kept the ISIS away from them. There was a, a virtual rape underway, and, and they got in there and stopped that. The problem is the United States is exer exercising too much of that power. Full spectrum dominance. I game. I know that part I agree with you. But it is for Trump. I mean, this assassination on Iraqi soil of that Iranian general, Soleimani. I mean, Obama did not want to do that. Oh, that was stupid. And he's still threatening Iran. He pulled out of the uh, Iran deal. Threat, even right now with the virus going on, he's threatening with military action. Threatened Venezuela with military action. He sent the U.S. fleet over to China. I remember, but he called for a confrontation, which was an act of war. This man is a loose cannon. He's not running on a full deck. I agree. Look, I don't support Trump. And, and I think, too, that Biden 
he's underestimated as far as his programs. I think his program on climate is good. I think his program on climate was actually better than Bernie. Are you, you're kidding, right? Nope. I've been analyzed that prior. It, it's pure neoliberalism. It's insufficient. It might buy us half a generation, maybe a full generation. Now, maybe Biden could be pushed into something like a Green New Deal. He, he calls it a Green New Deal. And a candidate can say anything they want or get elected. But if you look at his record, it's pretty abysmal. Yeah, I know that. I know that. But, I mean, politicians are weather veins. I think that the Democratic Party is serious about climate change because it's a major threat to national security. Let me explain to you why. I think that Biden's program was actually better than Bernie's. Number one, what Biden presented was something that can possibly be gotten through Congress. You can't get $17 trillion through the Congress. I mean, that's mission impossible. It's a virtue signal. That's not a plan. Number two, Bernie wants to shut down all the nuclear reactors in the United States. That's 50% of the clean power in the United States. If it, Trump it was to shut down all the solar panels and windmills in the country, wouldn't even be as bad. So then you're digging your way up. And the IPCC has said that without nuclear power, that it's impossible to do decarbonization without nuclear power. What Biden wants to put in is what they call small modular reactors that they don't melt down, which makes them extremely, extremely safe. You can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. It would take about 10 years. Germany, tried doing that. And I mean, they lead the EU in debts from coal. They lead the EU in the price of electricity. And they even led the EU in CO2 emissions. And like France, on the other hand, 80% they decarbonize with building out nuclear power. 100% renewable, it's not recognized but in the scientific community as being achievable. We geared up and mobilized for World War II in a year or two. Right, and that's the kind of mobilization that $17 trillion will buy you. So Bernie wasn't perfect, and Biden's not talking about doing that either. But it's going to have to be done. I don't think you're wrong about nuclear power. I think that's going to have to be part of the mix, at least until if we connect the, a global grid, then you can have solar power 24 hours a day. But let me ask you this, right? Have you ever heard of this, what they call Gen 4 reactors? No. They're capable of eating nuclear waste and turning it into energy. About 4% of spent fuel is actually spent. These advanced reactors could do that. Cheaper than coal, that's a projection. I think the first prototype will be out in 2024. And they're actually going to be cheaper than everything. So there's a lot of promise. But getting back to what we're talking about, I think that even $1.6 that Biden wants will be hard to get through Congress. If he gets elected, We'll have to push for that. But, you know, with Trump, you're not going to get anything. I like Bernie. I think he's, he's my hero, just like he's your hero. And he's done so much, but it's pie in the sky. Because even if he got in, he could only go as far as Congress enables him to do it. What you're ignoring in that problem is he was going to be the organizer in chief. In other words, he was going to have his movement was going to pressure Congress to do some of the things that need to be done. You're right. Congress wouldn't act unless there was enough pressure. Another point I want to make about Congress not going along with his agenda, which certainly be true initially, is if he had been able to get elected and own the bully pulpit, the midterms would be an opportunity for him to transform Congress. And at some point, we will be making it as clear as possible to as many voters as we possibly can using our networks. And we're going to try to basically make it impossible for Joe Biden to win this election. Trump is, is way worse than Joe Biden. No, I don't think so. Uh, Joe Rogan made a point recently. They, they deemed him Bernie or bust, but he's not because he's going to actually vote for D Donald Trump because Donald Trump is the lesser of evil. I think that Trump is way worse. I think the biggest threat with Trump is he is a racist, he's a misogynist. He has taken this nastiness to a new level. He's transformed the Republican Party from a dog whistle party into outright bullhorn shouts. And that's transformative. It's like Ronald Reagan. He brought in social Darwinism. We've been under social Darwinism ever since Reagan came in. A politician, especially a president, they set the tone for the whole consciousness of the nation. 
And Trump just brought in racism and authoritarianism to a great degree. And the courts are changing under him. All the way from the Supreme Court down to the circuit courts. They're all Trump people. I mean, Republican judges are not so bad. I mean, they could be libertarians. And if you talk like George Will type Republicans, they don't want a dictatorship. We're not going to have anything like democratic self-government because Biden supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is going to be a corporate power grab, unprecedented in history. That's going to be transformed into corporate self-government. Trump could put nine justices on the Supreme Court, and it won't be as destructive to democratic order and self-government in the United States as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this notion that Biden is better than Trump is a complete myth. All right, but hold on. Uh, back up a little bit, because you probably know a lot more about this than me, because I understand, I know from Bill Clinton and GATT and NAFTA how the corporations really already have power that's been given to them. They got these secret trade tribunals and everything that overrides governments. But how was this other one worse than that? It's wider than that. It's, it's instead of three nations, it's 12 nations giving up that democratic self-government and national self-determination. So yeah, you're right about NAFTA, although NAFTA has been replaced and the USMCA is mild improvements Although there's still that investor state dispute settlement provision of private tribunals, except now they're limited to oil and gas, you know, Trump. So in some ways it's a little bit better, but it still has that nasty private tribunal stuff that you referenced. And what we need to do is overthrow this corporate state that we're in. If Biden's elected, we still have a corporate state. He's a corporate tool. And with Trump, he's a corporation. He's Trump Incorporated. He'd like to be president for life. And not only that, they want net neutrality. So Elizabeth Warren's introduced some legislation to protect the election. So I don't know if she's replacing hand countable paper ballots or not, but that's going to be absolutely essential if we're going to have anything close to a legitimate election. Because if we don't have hand countable paper ballots, what we're going to have is a contest among hackers. If they don't replace these voting machines with paper ballots, that's not a crazy scenario. Except that it's not as easy as you think. I think you can't get away with it to a degree. It's like during World War II, the British broke the German code. We knew what the Germans were doing, but they had to use it sparingly because if the, if the Germans had seen it happening at all the time, they would catch on that something was going wrong. So right. it's only something they can use peripherally. You only get one shot at an election, and it's once every four years. Also, if a candidate found out or someone found out and they hired investigators who know about computers, I, there, there's a trail. Like, this was changed. If you watch that documentary, they showed that some of these hackers are able to do this with no trace. It depends on who your hackers are and how good they are. Fractional voting. It's not a hack. It's not a bug in the system. It's designed this way. It's a feature of the system that allows somebody with the master password to go in and every server in this country that uses these gem folders to hold this voter data can be accessed by someone with that password and modify the output to anything they want. So no one detects the fact that this thing's been rigged. So the hard part is you can't have somebody doing an entire state because there's too many counties. It's, that's easier said than done. That's a big oh, yeah. No, and I mention that because I know that you felt that this is what happened to Bernie. In Massachusetts. Maybe. Here's the thing, too, is that in the states where Bernie beat Hillary, he got beat. So let's say the DNC wanted to do this hacking. My question would be why they wouldn't do it right from the beginning and just cut them off at the legs before it even got started. Let's take Michigan and the general election as two examples. In both cases, Clinton expected to win. I think they didn't think they had to cheat. So in Michigan, Bernie scored an upset last time. This time they didn't take any chances. They made damn sure he didn't win in Michigan. That's why Biden one where Hillary lost last time around. They didn't take any chances. It's something that can't be proven or disproven, you know. Correct.
we don't we don't know. What we do know is that the exit polling is too far off. If it's more than I believe four percent, that's considered election fraud, however it happened. I wanted to get back to another point that we're talking about. Trump is a freaking monster. And if Hillary was in charge right now, I don't think we'd have as as, as big a problem at all with the coronavirus. I, I don't think we'd be here. I think her no fly zone over Syria would have caused war with Russia. And who knows what, how that would have escalated? I'll tell you, I, I voted for her anyhow, I think, because Trump is a monster. He's like the worst. Biden, I mean, oh my God, you know, I mean, him, I, I know the Democrats could not pick a, a worse candidate. Any one of those candidates that were on the stage could have defeated Trump, except for Joe Biden. He can't remember Obama's name. He doesn't know what state he's in. And Trump and his super PACs are going to be playing a, on an endless loop. Oh, yeah. They actually united around the one candidate who can't beat Trump. And the reason they did that is to defeat Bernie Sanders. Conversely, you'd have Democratic commercials with Trump up there with, him, with people with the body bags of going out left and right saying it's a hoax. And you're right. It's going to be this horrible back and forth negative campaign. Bernie or Buss will be the least of Joe Biden's problems. There are these people out there, they're like Joe Rogan, independent voters who backed Bernie Sanders and voted for Bernie Sanders in the primaries. When it comes to the general election, they're voting for Trump. They're not voting for more of the same, which is what Biden is actually saying. If I'm elected, nothing will change. He said that. And you can't convince these people. These aren't Bernie or Busters. Right? We never advocated voting for Donald Trump. They're three times more numerous than Bernie or Busters. I'm talking specifically about the Sanders Trump swing voters. They're older, they're whiter, and they're more conservative than most voters. But unlike Rogan, they're low information voters. And what they want, and this comes from uh, Rachel Bitkoffer, who predicted the blue wave in the House in the midterms, they want change. So that's not Joe Biden. His platform is a lot more progressive, thanks to Bernie Sanders, than people think. The problem is he's not articulate. Those swing voters, just like they did in 2016, will swing the election to Trump. You can't predict this. I, you know, when, when Trump was running against Hillary, even though I believed it was possible for Trump to win, I thought it was a long, long, long shot. And how? You're in Florida. How did you miss that? I mean, Florida went to Trump strong. Before the election, the polls were, were predicting Hillary was going to walk away with it. And you're right. We can't predict whether this is going to be close. It depends on how much the COVID pandemic settles down and how much the economy bounces back. Who you elect is who you have power over. And there's two different mentalities in the two bases. I mean, the Republican base, racist, theocrats, authoritarians, social Darwinists, super patriots. It's really a cesspool. Yeah, I get this old fear of Trump. He is a horrible president. He's incompetent. And a long list of complaints, including his right-wing justices. There's another point about, if you want to talk about Bernie or Buss, there's first and second time voters who call themselves the Bernie or Bus generation. They haven't been polled, so we don't know if we're talking about 10,000 of them or 100,000 or a million of them. But there, there's a bunch of them. They're staying home. Their version of or bust is to stay home. And Hillary Clinton herself said, Joe Biden's putting together my coalition. Well, you lost. <laughs> How is that a good thing? So if you don't trust him and you're advocating voting for him <laughs> because he's better than Trump, How's that going to fly? It's just not going to work. He's not an electable candidate. It's a mess. But I'll tell you something. This scares me more than everything is this, though, about Trump. And this is why I don't care if you put up there somebody who's catatonic against him. I'd vote for the guy who's catatonic. Because I'll tell you something. Trump is resurrecting a white nationalist movement that these people are like crazy. They call him for, for race war. And his reelection is empowering these people. It's, it, it, and, and there's, God, this is a freaking army of them. And they're armed. I don't disagree with that. You know, the uh, part of the people we blame for Biden's ability to beat Bernie is, is the progressive media. I've been begging them to talk about Bernie or Buss. I've been begging them to put the fear of Trump 
into these wine track middle class suburban Democrats who've been voting for Biden because they think he's electable because they don't know much about Bernie or Bust because the media won't talk about Bernie or Bust. It's like we don't exist. And it's not just MSNBC and CNN. Jimmy Dore, he won't talk about Bernie or Bust. In all likelihood, those white supremacists are going to dominate the next four years. Yeah, they will. And not only that, this could, could lay the groundwork for a real Hitler. Trump is not a real Hitler. The reason why Hitler was able to do what he did and take over completely is because the groundwork was laid by von Papen who was a Trump kind of character, right-wing politician who eroded the democratic institutions so badly that, that Hitler was just able to kick through the door. We live in a corporate state. Uh, Chris Hedges has been talking about that and writing about, about that. What we're advocating is a left-right movement. But let me ask you a question, because you talk about left and right. Now, if you're talking about going with green or socialists, that's all left. Why not the reform part? We're a committee of three people. We're not going to make that decision. We're going to put that before everybody. So everybody who's a Bernie or Buster will have a chance to decide who the third party candidate will back. That'll force the Democratic Party to take up some of those positions. That's already happening. Like I said, if you looked at Biden's platform right now, it is pretty progressive. If he actually was able to implement all of those things, you would see a major, major change for the better in the United States. It's going to have to happen more. And lip service isn't going to cut it. We're going to have to have some sort of people's movement to make demand. And the time to do that is now when the nation is crippled by this pandemic. You know, that's already happened. I think just the coronavirus will, uh, will bring a lot of changes. I mean, the Black Plague brought on the Renaissance. <laughs> Let's cross our fingers. I think this could bring about a whole new way. So if we go back to the way things were, which is what Trump wants and what Biden wants, it's going to be the worst thing that could come from this. Instead, corporations and individuals can learn how to redo this. We could use this pandemic to transform the way you can do things, especially using the internet and telecommunications and so forth, now that we couldn't do when they built this industrial system. People who want a, a livable planet can come together and, and start figuring out ways to learn from this pandemic well, Victor, this has been very provocative and interesting. I want to thank you for being on. Thanks for having me. And I want to thank all our viewers for being on as well. If you like what you have seen today, please hit the subscribe button and please stay well. And this is Gabe Ignetti, the progressive eco-modernist, saying we will see you till next time.